This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Thanks for coming. Um, it's my pleasure to, today to introduce Eun Lee, who's actually a Bay Area neighbor. She lives in Oakland with her husband and her two sons, who are actually here tonight with us. Um, Eun was born and raised in Beijing, and she received a Bachelor of Sciences degree and came to the United States in 1996 to pursue medical studies in immunology. But then, luckily for us, she swerved off to Iowa, where she received an MFA in creative nonfiction from the writing program and then an MFA in fiction from the writer's workshop. In 2005, she published a first collection of short stories titled A Thousand Years of Good Prayer, which dazzled reviewers and readers alike. Um, they were all reminded of Alice Munro and Chekhov. In The Guardian, Michael, Fraser wrote, uh, Michael Faber wrote, Eun Lee is the real deal. She has the talent, the vision, and the respect for life's insoluble mysteries to be a truly fine writer. There is a strangeness at the heart of her fiction that comes from somewhere other than China, a world inside the author. Um, and I completely agree with that. One of the stories titled Mortality won the Paris Review's Plimpton Prize for first fiction. In this story, a young boy who was born with a doppelganger's resemblance to Chairman Mao grows up to become his movie double. The story is funny, surreal, and tragic. To live as a commoner in a dictator's world is to experience something like a waking nightmare. To become him is to experience the nightmare from inside and outside, from bottom and top. I won't say any more. I think you should, um, if you haven't read the story, you should discover the pleasure of it yourself. In 2009, Eun published her first novel, The Vagrants. The novel opens in 1979 in a small town called Muddy River, which is one of the carefully planned and controlled products of the country's industrializing political culture. But the day on which the story begins is a holiday. A 28-year-old girl named Gu Shan is to be executed, and everybody, including children, have been given time off so they can participate in denunciation ceremonies that condemn Shan's counter-revolutionary thoughts and activities. From this planned death and its aftermath, Eun opens out the narrative to take in a varied cast of characters, including the girl's parents, a congenitally deformed 12-year-old girl named Nini, a boy named Bashi who is despised and shunned by his fellow citizens for his oddness, and a beautiful actress turned radio announcer who is driven into rebellion by the suffering and criminality she sees everywhere. The portrait that Eun constructs of this society is unflinching in its depiction of the brutality and selfishness forced upon people by a system that ironically idealizes selflessness. A father tells his seven-year-old son, if your heart is hard enough to eat your mother and your wife, nothing can beat you in life. And yet, each person is present to us in their troubled, mundane fullness. There is sympathy for even the most callous. The power of this extraordinary novel lies in its ability to show us the efficient horror of Gushan's execution and of the butchering and exploitation of her body. Her vocal cords are cut so she cannot speak during the denunciation ceremonies. Her kidneys are extracted for transplant into a high-ranking army officer. And what is left, um, her breasts and private parts are amputated and preserved by a man for his sexual gratification. Eun shows us all this and yet reminds us in every moment that these are not monsters, but human beings. In the New York Times, Pico Iyer wrote, this book is an individual's response to a collective madness. And since that individual is a novelist, it goes into precisely those places, psychological and emotional, that five-year plans try to deny or idealize out of existence. The vagrants reminds us of all the un uncounted, unnamed bodies that lie in the soil only a few feet beneath the latest flood of bright and celebratory billboards. In her latest book, a collection of short stories titled Gold Boy, Emerald Girl, even continues her exploration of this interiority of individuals caught up by the sweep of history. 
The stories are set up are set in contemporary China in the midst of enormous change, and the characters deal not only with this turbulence, but also the aftershocks of the past, which still rever reverberate through their lives. Francine Prose wrote in the New York Times, as in reading Chekhov, one is struck by how profoundly important the lives of ordinary people are made to seem, and by what a sizable chunk of existence, an entire life or several lives, has been compressed into a few pages. Ewan's work has been awarded numerous honors, including the Penn Hemingway Award and the Guardian First Fiction Award. And more recently, she was selected by Granta as one of the 21 best American novelists under 35. And then last year was named by the New Yorker as one of the top 20 writers under 40. Last year, she was named a fellow by the MacArthur Foundation. Um, those, those awards are more familiarly known to us as the Genius Awards. Um, please join me in welcoming Ewan Lee. Thank you very much. Good, good evening. Thank you for coming. This is a wonderful hour for story because usually readings are at night and these people cannot attend. <laughs> so I'm very happy. And thank you, Wickham, for that wonderful introduction. I think I'm going to read you uh, the opening story of Gold Boy, Emerald Girl. And it's a long story called Kindness. I'm going to read you. It's it's. 80 pages long, so I'm going to read you just part of it so you can get a sense of the story. Kindness. I am a 41-year-old woman living by myself in the same one-bedroom flat where I have always lived, in a derelict building on the outskirts of Beijing. Apart from a trip to a cheap seaside resort taken with my parents the summer I turned five, I have not traveled much. I spent a year in an army camp in central China, but other than that, I have never lived away from home. In college, after a few failed attempts to convince me of the importance of being a community member, my advisor stopped acknowledging my presence, and the bed assigned to me was taken over by the five other girls in the dorm and their trunks. I have not married and naturally have no children. I have few friends, though as I've never left the neighborhood, I have enough acquaintances, most of them a generation or two older. Being around them is comforting. Never is there a day when I feel that I am alone in aging. I teach mathematics in the middle school. I do not love my students or my job. But I have noticed that even the most meager attention I give to the students is returned by a few of them with respect and gratitude and sometimes inexplicable infatuation. I pity those children more than I appreciate them, as I can see where they're heading in their lives. It is a terrible thing, you see, even for an indifferent person like me, to see the bleakness lurching in someone else's life. I have no hobby that takes me outside my flat during my spare time. I do not own a television set. But I have a room for books at least half a century older than I am. I have never in my life hurt a soul, or if I have done any harm unintentionally. The pain I inflicted is the most trivial kind, forgotten the moment it is felt, if indeed it could be, it could be felt in any way. But that cannot be a happy life, or much of a life at all, you might say. That may very well be true. Why are you unhappy? To this day, if I close my eyes, I can feel Lieutenant Wei's finger under my chin, lifting my face to a spring night. Tell me, how can we make you happy? The questions put to me 23 years ago have remained unanswerable, though it no longer matters. As you see, Lieutenant Wei died three weeks ago. At 46, mother of a teenage daughter, wife of a stationary merchant, veteran of Unit 20256 People's Liberation Army, from which she retired at 43, already afflicted with malignant tumors. 
She was made her way in the funeral announcement. I do not know why the news of her death was mailed to me, except perhaps that the funeral committee thought I was one of her, one of her long lost friends, my name scribbled in an old address book. I wonder if the announcement was sent to the other girls. Though not many of them would still be at the same address. I remember the day Lieutenant Wei's wedding invitation arrived in a distant past, and thinking then that would be the last time I would hear from her. I did not go to the funeral, as I had not gone to her wedding, both of which took place two hours by train from Beijing. It is a hassle to travel for a wedding, but more so for a funeral. One has to face strangers' tears and words. One has to repeat words of condolence to irrelevant people. When I was five, a peddler came to our neighborhood one Sunday with a bamboo basket full of spring chicks. I was trailing behind my father for our weekly shopping of ration foods, and when the patter put a chick in my palm, its small body soft and warm and shivering constantly, I cried before I could ask my father to buy it for me. We were not a rich family. My father worked as a janitor, and my mother, ill for as long as I could remember, did not work and I had learned early to count coins and small bills with my father before we set out to shop. It must have been a painful thing for those who knew our story to watch my father's distress as two women offered to buy two chicks for me. My father, on the way home, ex warned, me, warned me gently that the chicks were too young to last more than a day or two. I built a nest for the chicks out of the shoebox and ripped newspaper and fed them water softened millet grains and a day later, when they looked ill, aspirin dissolved in water. Two days later they died, the one I named Dot and marked, and marked with ink on his forehead the first one to go, followed by mushroom. I stole two eggs from the kitchen when my father went to help a neighbor fix a leaking sink. My mother was not often around in those days. And I cracked the eggs carefully and washed away the yolks and whites. But no matter how hard I tried, I could not fit the chicks back into the shells. And I can see to this day the half shell on Dot's head, covering the ink spot like a funny little hat. I have learned since then that life is like that, each day ending up like a chick refusing to be returned to the eggshell. So that's the opening of this woman's monologue. And I'm going to jump a little and start again reading her monologue. A dream has occurred repeatedly over the past 20 years in which I have to give up my present life and return to the army. Always Lieutenant Wei was in the dream. In the early years, she would smile cruelly at me. Didn't I tell you that you would be back? The question was put to me in various ways, but the coldness remained the same. The dream had become less wicked as the years have gone by. I am back, I tell Lieutenant Wei. I always knew you would come back, she replies. We are older, having age in my dreams as we have in real life, the only remnants of a previous life among a group of chirpy teenage girls. These dreams upset me. Lieutenant Wei's marriage two years after I had left the army and her transfer to another city, which would know her only as a married woman and later a mother, and then would see her die, must have wiped her history clean so she could start collecting new memories, not about young, miserable girls in the camp, but about happy people who deserve to be remembered. I never showed up in her dreams, I am certain, as people we keep in our memories rarely have a place for us in theirs. You may say that we too evict people from our hearts while we continue living in theirs, and that may very well be true for some people. But I wonder 
if I am an anomaly in that aspect. I have never forgotten a person who have come into my life, and perhaps it is for this reason that I, could not have, I cannot have much of a life myself. The people I carried with me have lived up not only their own, their own rations, but mine too, though they are innocent usurpers of my life, and I have only myself to blame. For instance, there's Professor Shan. She was in her early 60s when I met her, but this may be the wrong way to put it, as she had lived in the neighborhood for as long as my father had. She must have watched my generation grow up and studied every one of us before singling me out. I like to imagine it that way. You see, for a lonely woman, it's hard now to make up some scenario that allow her to feel her, to believe herself special in some minor way. Professor Shen was in her early tw 60s and I was 12 when she approached me one September evening. I was on my way to the milk station. Do you have a minute, she asked. I looked down at the two empty bottles snuggled in the little carrier my father had woven for me. He had painted the reed, he had painted the dried reed different colors and the basket had an intricate pattern, though by then the colors had all paled. My father had a pair of hands that were good at making things. The wooden pack she, he put on the foyer wall for my school satchel and coat had red beaks and black eyes. The cardboard wardrobe had two windows that you could push open from inside. He had built my bed too, a small wooden one painted orange, just big enough to fit in the foyer alongside the wardrobe. We lived in a small one room unit the room itself serving as my parents' bedroom, to foyer my bedroom. There was a small cube of kitchen, a smaller cube of bathroom next to the foyer. Later it occurred to me that, later it occurred to me that we could not afford much furniture. But when I was young, I thought I w it was my father's hobby to make things with his own hands. Once upon a time, he must have made things for my mother too. But from the time my memory began, their bedroom had two single beds, my father's bare and neatly made, and my mother's piled with old novels. Do you have a minute I'm asking you? The old woman said again. I had developed a look of distraction, distractedness by then, and she was the now the most patient woman. I was on the way to the milk station, I stammered. I'll wait for you here, she said tapping on the face of a wristwatch with a long finger. I'm going to skip a little. She came back and she followed Professor Shen to her apartment. Professor Shen's place, a one-room unit also, seemed more crowded than ours, even though she lived there by herself. Apart from a table, a chair, and a single bed, the room was filled with trunks, dark leather ones with intricate patterns on the tops and sides, wooden ones with rusty metal clips, and two matching trunks, once bleached by, but by then more yellow than white, made of bamboo or perhaps straw, I couldn't tell which. On each trunk, there were books. She moved a pile of books to make a spot for me to sit on her single bed, and then took a seat in the only chair. Up to that point, I had not studied her, but I realized now that she was a beautiful woman. Her hair, grayish white, was combed into a tight bun, not a single strand running loose. Her face, the high cheekbones, the very prominent forehead, and the deep set eyes reminded me of a photograph of a female Soviet pilot in my textbook. I wondered if Professor Shen had some mixed blood. It was a secret joy of mine to study people's faces. I must take after my mother, who, apart from studying my face at meals, rarely took a bite. Sometimes waiting for us to finish eating, she would comment on the people passing by outside our window. Oily and puffy as fresh fried dough, she described the woman living a floor above us. The man next door had a long and bitter-looking face like a cucumber. 
My mother was the prettiest woman I had known until then, with almond-shaped eyes and a small heart-shaped face, a straight and a delicate nose, and, as I later learned from her collection of romantic novels from the early 1900s, a cherry petal mouth. When she grew tired of watching the world, she would study her own face in an oval mirror that she had kept close to her all day. A princess trapped in the fate of a handmaiden, she would say to no one in particular. My father, eating silently, would look up at her with an apologetic smile, as if he were a parent responsible for his child's deformed body. My father had married late in his life, my mother early, he at 15, she at 20. Two years later, they had me, their only child. When I was in elementary school, other children often mistook him for my grandmother, for my grandfather, but perhaps that was because he had to be a parent to my mother too. Together, my mother and I made my father grow old fast. You could see that in his stooped back and sad smile. Do you always let your mind wander in front of a teacher? Professor Shin said, though I could see the question was more an amusement than a criticism. In her youth, she must have been more beautiful than my mother. I wonder what my mother would think if she knew my opinion. One thing I was certain of was that my mother would not get along well with Professor Shan, eccentricity being both women's prized possession. I'm going to skip one page. So Professor Shan studied the, gir the girl. She studied me while I looked around the room, then picked up an old book and turned to a random page. Read the line to me, she said. The book was the first one in a series called Essential English, which Professor Shan had used to learn English 50 years ago. The page had a small cartoon of a child on a seat, the kind one could find in a luxurious theater. And I felt the same. Actually, no, sorry. Oh, no, I skipped the line. The page had a small cartoon of a child on a seat, the kind one could find in a luxury theater. In the cartoon, the child, was, who was not heavy enough to keep the seat from folding back, smiled uncertainly on his high perch, and I felt the same. I had entered middle school earlier that month and had barely learned my alphabet. When I could not read the caption, Professor Shan put the book back with the other volumes, their spines different colors that were equally faded. You do know that you are not your parents' first daughter, don't you? She turned and faced me. And you do know that no matter how nicely they treat you, they cannot do much for your education, don't you? I had not dotted my blood until then. I knew that my parents were different from most parents, but I had thought that it was their age difference and my mother's illness. Mo Yan, my mother sometimes said my name in a soft voice when my father was not around, and I would know that she had some secrets to tell me. A man can have children until he's 70, she would say. A woman's use ends the moment she marries. Mo Yan, do not let a man touch you, especially here and here, she would say, gesturing vaguely towards her own body. Mo Yan, your father will get your stepmother the moment I died, she would say, narrowing her eyes in an amused way. Do you know that I cannot die now because I don't want you to live and your stepmother? In one of those moments, she could have said, Mo Yan, you were not born to us. We only picked you up from a garbage dump. But no, my mother had never, even in her most uncharitable moment, said that to me. And in fact, she kept the secret until her death. And for that alone, I loved her and love her still. If your parents haven't told you this, someone else must, Professor Shen said when I did not reply. One needs to know where she came from. Do you understand? So that's their first encounter. I still have a couple minutes, I think. So I'll read, I'll skip a few pages. And so Professor Shen took 
the young narrator in to teach her English. And not only that, also she told Mo Yan about her parents' marriage. So I'll, t I'll read that part. When I had entered elementary school, I had been instructed by my father to put down, retired early from illness from my mother's occupation. What kind of illness, the teachers would ask. What did she do before she became ill? At first, I did not know how to answer, but by middle school, I became an expert in dealing with people's curiosity. She was a bookkeeper, I would say, the most tedious and lonely job I could come up with for my mother. Lupus was what had been troubling her. I would explain the name of the disease learned in fifth grade when a classmate's mother had died from it. The earliest I could remember people commenting on her illness was when I was four. I was standing in a long line waiting for our monthly egg ration when my father crossed the street to buy rice. What kind of parents would leave a small child to hold a place in line, someone asked. Asked someone who must have been new to the neighborhood. And a woman not far behind me replied that my mother was a mental case. Nymphomania was the word Professor Shan had used. And it was from her that I had learned the story of my parents' marriage. At 19, my mother had fallen in love with a married man who had recently moved into the neighborhood. And when the man claimed that he had nothing to do with her fantasy, she ran into the street calling his name and telling people she had aborted three babies for him. They would have locked her up permanently had it not been for my father's marriage proposal. My father, who people had thought would remain a bachelor for life, came to my mother's parents and asked to take the burden off their hands. Which would you have chosen for your daughter had you been a mother? Professor Shan asked me. An asylum or an old man? She told me the story not long after I'd become a regular visitor to her flat. I had stammered, not knowing how to pass the test. Professor Shen said that it was my mother's good fortune that her parents had given her up to a man who loved her rather than to an asylum. Love makes a man blind, she added, and I wondered if my father's misfortune was transparent to the world. So that's the parents' marriage. So I'll read a couple more excerpts. So, so Mo Yan grew up, and while she was uh, a young girl, Professor Shan to, uh, tutored her English by reading English novels to her, and they started with uh, they started with Dickens and moved on to Thomas Hardy, and later, when she was old enough, <coughs> Professor Shan started to read D. H. Lawrence to her, and so I'm going to read. And later, when she was 18, she went to the Chinese army, and she brought a book of D.H. Lawrence's stories that she stole from Professor Shan. By then, they would not talk, but she stole a copy of Lawrence's story from Professor Shan. So this part happens in the army. The civilian world slowly crept in on us in the forms, in the forms of letters from old school friends and packages of chocolate from parents, memories of childhood holidays and teenage expectations. And in my case, Professor Shan's voice reading D.H. Lawrence, her tone unhurried. Well, Mabel, and what are you going to do with your life? When I closed my eyes at the shooting range, I could hear her voice, and the question posed from one character to another now seemed to request an answer from me. Or else, to her father, she was the princess. To her Boston aunts and uncles, she was just Dolly Urquhart, poor little thing. The point of a boot kicked my leg and I opened my eyes. I was not in Professor Shan's flat, released momentarily from responsibility by her voice, but face down, my elbows on, a, on sandbags, my right cheek resting on the wooden stock of a, auto, of a semi-automatic rifle. The late October sunshine was warm on my back. And 200 yards away, the green target in the shape of man's upper body stood in a long line. 
Two magpies chatted in the nearby tree, and the last locust of the season, brown with greenish patterns, sprang past the sandbags and disappeared into the yellowing grass. I shifted my weight and aligned my right eye with the front and the rear sides. The training officer did not move, his shadow cast on a sandbag in front of me. I waited, and when the shadow did not leave, and when the shadow did not leave, I pulled the trigger. Apart from a crack, nothing happened. It would be another two weeks before we would be given live ammunition. Do you think you got a tent there? asked the training officer. Yes, sir, I said, still screaming at the target. He sighed and said he did not think so. Try again, he said. I held the rifle closer so that the butt was steadied by my right shoulder. I had noticed that people once put into army belong, became, become two different species of animals, those who were eager to please like the most loyal, best-trained dogs, and those who, like me, acted like the most stubborn donkeys and needed a prod for every move. I looked through the sights and pulled the trigger. Much better, the training officer said. Now remember, the shooting range is not a place to nap. Shooting practice was one of the few things I enjoyed in the Army. Major Tan showed up occasionally to inspect us, but since aiming was one thing we had to practice on our own, he had little patience for staying at the shooting range for hours. The three platoon leaders, including Lieutenant Wei, sat in the shade of ash trees and chatted while two of the shooting officers for the company, who liked to sit down with them, told jokes. Our officer, older and more reticent, sat a few steps away and listened with an indulgent smile. The two girls on my right talked in whispers, and now and then I caught a sentence. They were discussing boys, analysis and guesses that I did not bother to follow. On my left, Nan hummed a tune under her breast while maintaining a perfect shooting position. I was amazed at how soldierly she could act. Her posture perfect in form, in formation drills, her impeccable bed making winning her titles in the internal affair context. Anyone could see her heart, her mind was elsewhere, but the military life seemed to provide endless amusement for her. She never behaved, she never be misbehaved, and she was among the few who hadn't received any public humiliation. I turned my head slightly, still resting my right cheek on the stock, but looking at Nan rather than the target. Her uniform cap was low on her eyebrows, and in the shadow of the cap she screened it with a smile, singing in a very low voice. The last rose of summer, she told me when I asked her about the song, during the break. Nan was a small girl and looked no more than 13 years old. She had joined a famous children's choir when she was six, when the other children her age had entered middle school and left the choir. She had remained because she liked to sing, and she could still pass for a young child. When she reached 16, the choir changed its name from children's choir to children's and young women's choir. She laughed when she told us about it. Would she go back to the choir, one of the girls had asked her. And she had thought for a moment and said that perhaps after the army she would have to find some other hobbies. One could not possibly remain a children's choir all her life, she had said. Though she seemed to me the kind of person who could get away with anything she set her heart on. I'm going to skip a little bit. One girl overhearing our conversation asked Nan to sing the last rose of summer. Nan stood up from where she was sitting, she was sit where we were sitting in a circle, and flicked dried grass and leaves from her uniform. Her voice seemed to make breathing hard for those around her. Her face, no longer appearing amused, had an ancient age look, ageless look. I wondered what kind of person Nan was to be able to sing like that. She seemed too aloof to be touched by life. But how could she sing so hauntingly if she had not felt the pain described in those songs? The shooting range was quiet when Nan finished singing. A bumblebee buzzed and was shooted away. And in the distance, 
perhaps over the hills where a civilian world could not be seen. A loudspeaker was broadcasting mid news, midday news, but we could not hear a word. After a while, a girl from another platoon who had sneaked away from her school, from her school to join our circle back Nan to tell us something about her trips abroad. Apart from Nan, none of us had traveled abroad. None of us have had a legal reason to apply for a passport. So I need to jump just a little bit more. Just read one more part about Nan, since we're on this very young girl who can sing very well. And so this jumped a little bit. So in the spring, the army went on to the army went on to march in the mountain area. And I'm going to read the first day of the march. And the first day they took the army truck into the mountain. We were jostled in the covered lorries for hours, it seemed, on the winding mountain road, and our excitement was slowly replaced by exhaustion. On a particularly uneven stretch of road, Nan stood up from where she was sitting on her bedroll and worked loose the rope that bound the two roof traps tarps together. Lieutenant Wei, who was sitting at the other end, ordered her to sit down. Nan looked out the gap for a long moment and then retied tarps as best as she could. If the lorry missed a turn, we would all die together, she said to no one in particular, and began to sing in English. If you miss the train I'm on, you will know that I'm gone. You can hear the whistle blow a hundred miles. Her voice was more sorrowful than ever, though there was a smile on her face. Lieutenant Wei seemed to be as stricken as we were, even though she could not understand what Nan was singing. When the song ended, we listened to the tree branches scratching the tarp and pebbles bumping up the wheels of the lorry. I wondered why sadness seemed to roll off Nan as raindrops rolled off a lotus leaf without leaving any trace. I wondered how one could acquire an unaffected soul as she had. I'm going to stop here. So the story followed, the, <laughs> the story, I'm going to just give a brief storyline. The story followed her, her journey you know, in the army. At one, at one time, at one moment in the army, because she read English, her, 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 another woman got a, got hold of a copy of, um, it was banned in China, Lady, Lady the Chatterer's Lover. And the other young woman asked the narrator to read Lady Chatterer's Lover and marked all the sex scenes because the other woman did not want to read English, but she wanted to have a sex education. <laughs> and she was reading this banned book when she was caught by Lieutenant Wei and you know had a very long strange friendship with Lieutenant Wei and later she returned to you know to spend her whole life all her life reading with uh, Professor Shan so that's the story it's it's sort of long but I think I hope you get a small part of it so I think it's question yeah Q&A time so I would be happy to answer any questions no, actually, the, I, it's so interesting you ask about the, the character's name. Actually, I, I, I imagine her name in, in, in Mandarin, and Mo Yan in Mandarin is do not speak, which is exactly what I imagined the name for her, is she does not want to speak. And actually, funnily, I, I, I told my best friend when I wrote that story, I said Mo Yan's name means do not speak. And she said, well, what a strange... Tr what a strange thing to name your child that. And I said, well, in fact, I grew up with this girl whose name was Mo Yan, do not speak. But she happened to be the luckiest girl ever because her grandfather was a high rank official. So when we were all staffing, she had, you know, box of chocolates in her house. So I thought I really want to borrow her name because that, sh that name does not belong to her. <laughs> so I borrowed the name. <laughs> so I did, you know, it is an intentional move to name her Moyen, yes. Yes. 
Was there any specific reason why the mountain were named Nirvana? But pardon me, the mountain. The mountain where they hiked us. The, I, I, near the end of the first chapter. The, the mountain, it's called Dabi. Is that, it's, it's actually a real mountain in central China. We, so it's a coincidence, yes. Yes, go ahead. My question is, uh, it seems like uh, uh, you write a lot about the Chinese family. Mm -hmm. Do you have a special concern for the Chinese family? And what do you think is significant? <laughs> do I have a concern for Chinese families? I have a concern for all families. <laughs> and I remember a friend of mine said, uh, Juno Diaz, he said something. He said, in his family, they talk, but they do not communicate. And I said, that's not your family. In every family, I mean, every family has that problem. I mean, people talk, and like the character said, people chatter and chatter. They talk all the time, but they do not tell their feelings to each other. So, so I do have a concern for families, but not particularly Chinese families. I think it's easy for me, not easy, but I think I'm familiar with the way Chinese families, you know, are together. They don't, they talk about surface things. They don't talk about real things. But that you can see in every country, in every culture. I remember, I, I love telling the story. A friend of mine was, uh, she lives in New York City and she, she her parents, she, I, I guess the, her parents' best friends died. This is an older couple and, and, she grew up knowing this couple to be the most loving couple, you know, in, in her family's circle. So when the, when the couple died, she helped she helped taking care of the, the estate sale, and she said, "You go down the base, go down to the basement, and you find this this partition in front of the basement, separating it to the wife's part and the husband's part." And on the petition on both sides were written years of profanities against each other. That's just heartbreaking, but that's exactly how families live. They actually maintain a surface while they hate each other. So I think, I mean, it's a long answer to your question. I think, I'm, you know, family is the backbone of society. You, know, if you look everywhere, there's always a family or miss, missing family members. So those things are, you know, what storytellers like to look at. So, yes, I am very concerned about all the families. Yeah, I feel like, uh, especially, you write a lot about parents in their, in their old age uh, and their relationships with their mm -hmm. adults, children. Mm -hmm. well, why do you like that? Why do I like to write that one, that's a very good question. I, 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 when I was finishing this novel, I show, I told Colm Tobin, I don't know if you know the Irish writer, and I said, well, I said, it just happened, I have a lot of older characters in my book. And he said, well, Americans have a very good name for that. You should name your books Senior Citizens. <laughs> and I said, well, that's not going to sell. <laughs> Why do I like to write about older characters? I think there's one reason is I like to, you know, I'm sure you all hear that you write what you know or write, don't write what you know, write what you want to know. And for me is, it's very important to write about experience that I haven't experienced. So I, I think a lot of characters are older or, you know, older parents with their grown up children. I like to imagine, you know, I like, I like to write about those characters because I like to imagine how it feels. I'm, I'm a younger woman. I mean, I'm not young anymore, but I'm still not very old, but I like to imagine how it feels you know, to be in your 80s and walking across the street, you know, you have already lost your agility. You have, you know, how it feels when your eyesights are not very good and how the world, I mean, what the world would become, you know. I, I read somewhere, I think, um, I don't know if it's true, but Monet, when, when he painted, I think when he get, got older, his, his eyesight deteriorated. So if you look at his later paintings, they were more blue and green, I think. Maybe I'm making it up. I'm sorry, I'm looking for you to help. I, I just read it somewhere. I think, you know, it's very interesting to imagine for an artist when he, you know, in, a, in, a, in his life cycle, he grew older and he saw things differently. And, and for me as a storyteller, a teller, I, I like to see things sort of, you know, from the inside where 
if I can get inside a character's head and see. So that's sort of the thing. <laughs> yeah, there's a hand there. <laughs> In Mandarin, nan means difficult or hard, like nan, how nan. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and nan, is, um, she's talented and she's a good singer. So I was wondering if, if it was coincidence that you named her like nan because she's hard to get. <laughs> <laughs> In the story, there was a male soldier who bribed uh, Mo Yan to confess for her. Yes. No, Nan is, <laughs> well, Nan is name without any I intention. I, I just like Nan as a name. <laughs> well, part of the, I think part of the difficulty, I mean, when we write about another culture is you have to make the characters' names accessible to your readers. I can give you a very difficult Chinese name and then the character, I mean, but on the other hand, if you read Russian novels, they always have, you know, 80 letter names and you still remember them. So that's not an excuse to name your character just Nan, but I, but I, like, I like that name. So I, yeah, it's simple. Other questions? Oh, yes. Sorry, I didn't see. Have, have you ever been in the Chinese military before? Yes, I was in the army for a year. And I, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I mean, the, I, certainly I borrowed some part from my own experience. And again, you know, I, 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 I don't think I'm an autobiographical author in that way, writer in that way. I don't write about my experience often. But whatever you experience as a writer, you know, is useful for you. For instance, you know, the army experience. It, it's, it's interesting to know these things and to look back about, you know, I think that one episode about reading Lady Chatterley's Lover, I did read in the army, really, Chatterley's lover for, for a friend who refused to read English, but who wanted to have some, you know, education about things. <laughs> I would just realize there are underage people here. <laughs> but they're used to that. So, so, <laughs> so those are the kind of things, you know, little incidents you could borrow from your life, but the characters are not me. I mean, none of my characters miss me. <laughs> It's very interesting. Why do I choose David, David Copperfield? David Copperfield, I mean, again, I, <laughs> this sounds like I use a lot of my own life, which is not true, but, but, when you <laughs> but when you write, you know, when you make up other characters' lives, you also want a little bit of something in there. It's not about me or about my family, but I sort of, you know, oftentimes I put me into like a very small character, very minor character, I would put, myself in there and sort of just catch a glimpse of myself or someone I know. But I think David Copperfield, uh, I mean, I had a long history with David Copperfield. The, the, I was eight when the, I think I was seven when, I, I live in this apartment, apartment building and I was seven when there was the first television set in my building. Who, which belonged to you know, our neighbor. And it was about you know, 79 and 81 just the country just started to open the door. So, so the, the, the TV station imported a mini series called David Copperfield. <laughs> and so every, every Tuesday, not every Tuesday, I think it's every Saturday, every Saturday evening when David Copperfield came on, all the neighborhood kids were going there for education. <laughs> so we're all sitting there. I remember the scenes with you know the poor orphans and trying to get something to eat and all was very Dickensian. So also of course I, I mean I love that experience. So I also I do love David Copperfield. I like I like Dickens a lot. So I thought, well, that is, you know, a small, very tiny slice of my life into the story. I would put David Copperfield in. <laughs> You know, it's very interesting. I think there's one review that said I thought I really like it, and it because I mean, she, the review mentioned that Victorian love stories, and I did. I think in a way, I think this 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 story or this novella was 
written to explore those themes, you know, particularly you know, love, loneliness, and you know, isolation. I'm, I'm, that's not only Victorian literature. That's everything. Every liter you know, every book is about those themes. But I did quote a few quotes from D.H. Lawrence, and sort of, you know, those those Lawrence quotes became a motif for the story. You know, at one point. I think that it was in the Lawrence story, I think it was the rocking horse story, it said, you know, she's a beautiful woman, but she has no luck. So that that line, I think, was quoted in the novella, and it was a repeated motif about the mother who was a beautiful woman, but who had no luck. And, and there was another line, I think it was in D.H. Lawrence story, Princess, where again, it was the princess mother said she had no great desire to live, so she died early. She was nasty line, you know, she had no great desire to live or something. So I took the first part again, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a theme about the, the Moyen's mother. She had no great desire to live, but she kept her promise to be married to a man and all those things. So yes, I think, you know, I, I did borrow a lot from Victorian literature. <laughs> I know you, you've been reading David Copperfield, right? Yes. <laughs> How do I make the people come to life and the plot? Well, I do <laughs> it's a very odd business. You just have to live with your characters for long. I mean, yes, I think it's very strange. You, you just, day in, day in, day out, you live with your characters and think about what they see, what would interest them. And I mean, sooner or later, there's something about the characters that would strike you as very uniquely, you know, that characters. I, I'm just thinking if I can give one example. Yeah, there's this, this character in, in, in The Vagrants in the novel who was a teenage boy who liked to, her, his whole, I mean, at the beginning of the novel, the whole existence of him, the, his whole goal was to see a girl's private parts. And that really just made up his, you know, drive to live. and. <laughs> that's not apparently that's not me. And how do you get into his head? Was when I figured out that was the thing he really wanted. And you sort of just w entered his head. He was he was a young man without any like, knowledge. I mean, without any knowledge, or access to any female bodies or you know books about female bodies. How so? How did he do it? So when you entered his head, of course, geniusly, geniusly. I mean, very smart. I came up with all these sort of you know plans for him. Like at one time, he thought he would put on his grandmother's you know clothes and put on a shore, and he would go to the women's you know. The, the the public bathroom, and he would go to the women's locker room, and he would you know pretend he was an old woman, or you know, or he 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 also thought he could you know in the middle of the night he could hide in the women's bathroom in the, the public toilet, he would he would hide there you know pretending he was a woman, and then he thought it was too cold and too stinky, and I mean <laughs> you 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 went into his head, and then you started to have these scenarios, and the more you think about him, the more, and then he became really alive to me, all his little plans to get to a woman really just is how I got access to him. So I'm sorry, that's a very wrong note to end the talk. But, but let's just finish here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>